Arizona's history is rich with the tales told of the men who settled here. But that history is also rich with the efforts and accomplishments of pioneering women. Unfortunately, the stories of our grandmothers are seldom told, and that robs all of us of a significant part of our heritage. Today, we can take a second look at the women of early Arizona. We can begin to tell the whole story of what they did and of the women they were. That Nellie Bush, she was never afraid to try anything. She was also a state legislator who served for 16 years and got her law degree in her spare time. Now, not too many women did that in those days. She was also a justice of the peace and a city attorney over in Parker. But it was her hobbies that amazes me the most, and oftentimes her hobbies turn into business. She was a state's first and only riverboat pilot. That's right, riverboats on the Colorado. And then there were her airplanes. She loved them. Not only was she Arizona's first woman commercial pilot, but she owned and operated her own airport. I sort of think of Nellie Bush as Arizona's Renaissance woman. <laughs> Goodness, she did it all, or at least she tried. I'm Mary Jo West. I'm a journalist reporting a story. Well, maybe what we're trying to do here is to shed some new light on an old story about some of the women who helped to build our state. But perhaps this could best be done, not by me, but through the eyes of a woman who was a leading journalist in Arizona at the turn of the century. And so with the magic of television, we can step back in time. You're probably wondering who I am. The name's Hammer, Angela Hammer. I'm gonna take you on a little trip across the state through time. We're gonna meet some women who are a lot like you and me. They just wanted the opportunity to do something meaningful with their lives. You know, in any game, you can't win unless you're allowed to play. And in the game of government and politics, there was a time in Arizona when women weren't allowed to play. Well, that got changed, of course, owing largely to the determination of a woman from Prescott named Frances Munns. In Arizona, we women won the right to vote in 1912, eight years before women in the rest of the country but what a fight it took. Actually, we had won the battle in the territorial legislature clear back in 1903. We had a lot of support. Unfortunately, that support did not include that of the territorial governor, a somewhat misguided man by the name of Brody. He vetoed the bill. We fought on for another nine years until statehood, February 14, 1912. Then we got the right to vote. Of course, I took full advantage of my rights and got myself elected to the state senate. Can you imagine the reaction of all those old fogies when suddenly they had a grandmother amongst them in the senate? <laughs> they learned to live with it. Actually, I was the second woman in America to be elected to a state senate, but the very first woman in the entire United States to be elected to a state house of representatives was also from Arizona. That was my friend Rachel Berry who hailed from the St. John's area of Apache County. I always thought it was a bit curious that modern day historians seem to overlook Rachel Berry's accomplishment. I bet they remember the name of the first male legislator. Well, during those early decades, quite a few women jumped into the political fray. Anna Fromiller from Flagstaff had served for 24 years as our state auditor and served well. Finally, in 1950, she became the Democratic nominee for governor. She ran a good race. But when the votes were counted, Anna had lost by only one and a half percent. Isabella Greenway of Tucson had been a good friend of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's. As a matter of fact, she was maid of honor in their wedding. Well, in 1932, when FDR was busy running for president, Isabella jumped right in and ran for Congress. And you know, they both won. Congresswoman Greenway never was defeated. But after serving two terms in Washington, she chose not to seek re-election. I'm proud of Arizona's own Sandra O'Connor, who became the first woman ever to sit on the United States Supreme Court. But, in a sense, she too had a forerunner. Lorna Lockwood was an active woman, a lawyer, a state legislator, a judge. Then, in 1961, she became a justice of the Arizona State Supreme Court. Now, there had been other women in other states who had done that, 
But four years later, Lorna Lockwood became the first woman in America to become a Chief Justice of a State Supreme Court. Well, today women play many roles in Arizona government. And upon occasion, a woman has been elected to office and got more than she bargained for. The story that stands out in my mind is that of Elsie Tolles of Bisbee. In 1920, I became State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Now, in those days, the state school superintendent was automatically a member of the parole board. I was an educator. I never gave a second thought to the parole board until soon after taking office, I received this postcard from the prison. It reads, please save my life. I am sentenced to be hanged September 9th. Well, I was stunned. For the first time, I realized I had the power to send a human being to his death. A lot of people, men and women, said the parole board was no place for feminine sympathy and emotionalism. They had not wanted me there. I feared they might be right. I'll never forget the day we faced this man across the parole board table. He was Armenian, and in a torrent of limited English, he poured out a despairing cry for mercy. His anguish plea rang in my ears for months, but there was no choice. He was found guilty and he had to pay the penalty, and he did. In the newspaper business, at least in my day, you had to learn to live with ink on your hands. Horrible stuff. <laughs> but you know the truth is, I love this business. I must. After all, I started a lot of papers over the years. There was the Wickenburg Miner, the Wyndon News, the Swansea Times, the Casa Grande Dispatch, the Phoenix Messenger, oh, and some others. You'd think I'd gotten rich somewhere along the way. No. No, I always had the faculty to antagonize the very segment of the society which would have been in my interest to nurture their friendships. <laughs> that's just a sophisticated way of saying I never learned to keep my mouth shut. Oh, that's okay. There were too many battles to fight to worry about being genteel. You know, an editor has a responsibility to fight the fights. The people count on you to do that. And this business about being a woman in what's supposed to be man's work, well, I never thought much about it. An editor is an editor. To me, business is business. I know of a woman, she lived long before my time, who took the same attitude. Her name was Eulalia Elias. She and her brothers ran an empire with cattle, mining, agriculture, and other businesses. They virtually controlled northern Sonora and southern Arizona during the early 19th century. And that was before we ever heard of the term multinational conglomerates. Well, in talking about women in Arizona history, I'm most partial to women writers like Edith Stratton Kitt, who for nearly 25 years ran the Arizona Pioneers Historical Society. As an historian, she did a lot of her research by attending funerals. That's right, funerals. She figured what better way to locate elderly pioneers than to be present when they sent a friend off to that last roundup. Then there was Charlotte Hall. Perhaps you visited the Charlotte Hall Museum in Prescott. That's next to the Territorial Governor's Mansion, which she restored. Now, Charlotte was territorial historian around 1910, but more than that, she was a poet and a writer. Her book, Cactus and Pine, was one of the best in capturing the mood of what it was really like growing up on the Arizona frontier. Now, here's a book that captures some history, Phoenix Union High School, 1920. On page 47, we find Anna Moore, who later became Anna Moore Shaw. Now, she was a Pima Indian who spent her life observing and living the contrast between the Native American and Anglo cultures. Her two books, Pima Indian Legends and A Pima Past, make an important contribution in the way we understand our Arizona heritage. But when I think of all the early pioneering women, none is quite as exciting as Nellie Cashman. My sister and I came from Ireland in the early 1860s and settled in San Francisco. I, looking for opportunities, moved on to Tucson, Arizona Territory, and later to Tombstone, where I had a restaurant business and a hotel as well. You know, I always tried to be a good citizen, don't you know? Oftentimes, though, that meant having to twist some arms to help raise money for churches, schools, charities, and the like. Well, you know, 
I think it can be fair to say that I had one true love in my life, and that was prospecting. Many a times I would grub stake some poor prospector. Or, you know, when people were down on their luck, I just did what I had to do to see that they got by. And then I decided to do some prospecting. I, those were the days. Many a times I would venture out into the Sonoran Desert, looking for the mother load, don't you know? Unfortunately, most of my success was from business and not from mine. And I guess it was something, a dream I had in my blood. Well, tombstones started to die out in the 1890s, it was and I decided to move on to a more fertile, if not colder, territory, the Alaskan Klondike. Well, for the next part of the 30 years I was there, well, I, I just did what I did best. I operated a store, kept searching for the gold, and did what I could for all those poor, struggling prospectors and their families. Perhaps one of her most interesting accomplishments was also her last. Nellie Cashman had become quite a proficient musher, that is, a dog sledder. In 1924, at the age of 79, she became the champion woman musher of the world. She drove her dog team 750 miles in 17 days, breaking her own trail the entire distance from Koyukuk to Seward, Alaska. in Arizona sometimes take pride in their complaints about the weather. But if we could be transported back, say, 110 years, oh, we'd find out what desolation was really like. It was about that time that Charles Hayden brought to the banks of the Salt River his new wife, Sally. I want you to know I never had the slightest interest in coming out here to be a pioneer. Who would? This place was hot and dusty. I miss the gardens and flowers I'd grown up with in Arkansas. I can't say I ever really adjusted to the place. I just tried to change it. Well, I'm the first person to bring Bermuda grass to this valley. Some people have never forgiven me for that. But I was simply trying to make the place a little more civilized. They say that's the wife's duty. Actually, I had some real reservations about ever being a wife. Seems to me a girl has a future till she marries. Then the train usually comes to a stop. Oh, life wasn't so bad here in what you'd call Tempe. They were building a city. Well, I knew a lady named Cordelia Crawford who was helping her husband build a cattle business up in the White Mountains. Her day-to-day -day problems included unexpected visits from certain none-too-friendly Apaches. Now, Cordelia was a smart woman and a talented nurse. She made friends with the Apache women by treating their children when they got sick. In return, she got advance warning about when to expect an attack from the Apaches. We call it a bit of frontier diplomacy. It sure saved a lot of lives. Fifty years later, over in Mojave County, there was another woman helping her husband build a cattle business. Her name was Amy Neal. She didn't worry about Indian raids, but she had that same frontier spirit. Whether she was working on the cattle roundups or organizing the first county fair, it was all part of an effort to make Arizona a more civilized place to live. One of the things we never had enough of in the early days was art and culture, but there are a few women who ought to be remembered. May Bartlett Hurd, a very generous woman whose donations made possible the Phoenix Public Library, the Art Museum, the Phoenix Little Theater, and of course the Hurd Museum. And then there was Carmen Vasquez down in Tucson, who founded Teatro Carmen, the first Spanish language theater in Arizona. Not one of those movie houses, but a real stage theater featuring the finest actors from throughout the world. And we mustn't forget Mary Colton of Flagstaff, who with her husband founded the Northern Arizona Museum. She was a gifted artist and writer and a specialist in Indian arts and crafts. They say she introduced the frontier to fine art and introduced the nation to the art of the frontier. Well, I'll just leave you with this story. My family was Southern and with the Confederacy. They were heartbroken when they lost the war. I never let that bother me, because I know I got even with at least one Yankee. I married him.
Now, with the exception of one small battle, the Civil War wasn't fought here in Arizona, but its impact was measured by all those people who came out west to get away from it. One such person was Mary Bernard of Westport, Missouri. Ultimately, she became Professor Mary Bernard, Chairman of the Department of Spanish at the University of Arizona. But that was many adventuresome years later. When my husband, Nepifano, and I were married in 1862, he took me by wagon from Missouri to New Mexico. Oh, I, I really thought I'd never want to make that journey again. But as it turned out, I crossed the plains with him in a wagon no less than five times. You see, his family was in the freight business. I preferred to travel with him rather than to stay at home. Ultimately, in January of 1870, it was that very business that cost him his life. He was driving a wagon near Sassabee when a band of Apaches attacked, and he was killed. I moved back to Missouri, and then I moved to Tucson, where I became a teacher in the first public school for girls in a classroom very much like this one. You see, it wasn't yet common for girls to be publicly educated, and the 20 or so young ladies at my school were among the most unruly set the good Lord ever let live. Oh, but I showed them discipline. And most of them turned out just fine. As a matter of fact, some of them even had careers. But I think the most important thing is that we laid the foundation for the concept of public education for boys and for girls. I believe that the most basic element of what you call frontier spirit is that basic act of helping others get ahead. For example, there was a lady who helped more than 1,400 immigrants to become United States citizens. Her name was Placida Garcia Smith. For 32 years, she ran the Friendly House in Phoenix, where she helped new Americans to learn the English language, to develop skills, and to find jobs. And then there was Jane Ryder, who probably did more for public health in Arizona than any other person. Now, she was the first woman engineering graduate from the university in Tucson. Her career was filled with successful crusades for sanitary milk processing, water purification, sewer systems, and standards for cleanliness in the state's restaurants and food stores. I wonder what she thought of being known as the mother of sanitation in Arizona. The movement of women into professions was often a slow process, and sometimes a woman almost had to sneak into it, like Mary Jane Coulter. She was trained as an architect, but her entry into the field was a summer job decorating the interior of a tourist building at one of the Fred Harvey hotels. Oh, but that was all the start she needed. For over the next 46 years, Mary Jane stayed with the Harvey Company, becoming its chief architect and giving us such landmarks as Bright Angel Lodge, Phantom Ranch, Hermit's Rest, The Watchtower, Lookout Studio, and so many others. For women over the past 100 years or so, the struggle has not just been learning how to compete, but learning that it's all right to compete. And so with this spirit, we end this chapter of our story here on an athletic field at Phoenix College. For it was here that a lady named Laura Heron devoted some 26 years of her life, instilling into young women and young men good sportsmanship and the love of competition. Laura's was an active career. She had been an official at the 1928 Olympics. She developed curricula for training teachers in health and physical education and she was one of the organizers of Phoenix's Parks and Recreation Department. And of course, she coached softball, archery, tennis, basketball, hockey, track and field. But Laura Heron's work should be viewed as more than just teaching athletic skills. It's symbolic of the transitions in women's roles over the past 100 years. And it's appropriate that we make the transition back to a modern world. Laura Heron carried a message representative of all those we've met on this program. That given the opportunity to compete, the chance to play the game, and the determination to succeed, Arizona's women, and for that matter, all women, 
will make their mark in any field of endeavor they choose.